I'm going to show you four ways to convert between Big Endian and Little Endian and vice versa, starting with the slowest because that also happens to be the easiest one to understand. Keep watching to the end because I'm also going to reveal a gotcha that can really trip you up and give you best practices on how to write Endian as handling code that will work on any CPU. I am of course assuming that you already know what Endian is. If you don't, then go watch my intro video on the topic. I'll leave a link below. So the most obvious way to do Endianous conversion is to physically shift each of the individual bytes. So for example, here I've got a function that byte swaps a 32-bit word, and it's done like this. You take the value and you end it with a bit mask to isolate one of the bytes like this, and then you either right shift or left shift that byte to the right location. So in this case, this first byte gets shifted to the right by 24 bits. And then finally, you or all the individual bytes back together again to form the byte swap 32 bit number. And that certainly works. If you look at here, we've got a 16 bit Indian swap. So 0123 becomes 2301. And then 32 bit swap, 64 bit swap. Uh, the 64 bit byte swap code looks a little bit ugly. And this works on every single CPU, regardless of Indianness, but it's rather slow. It's like here with the 32 bits, just to a uh, spite swap, a 32-bit word, we've got 1, 2, 3, 6, 9, 11 instructions, and most modern CPUs have built-in byte swapping instructions that can do it in one go. Theoretically, if the compiler's optimizer figures out what you're doing with this, figures out what this means, that it could optimize it away to the byte swapping instruction. However, don't count on it. Now, so obviously for speed, we'd want to use the CPU's built-in byte swapping instructions. Now we could do that by inserting assembly code into our C code. However, then we'd have to write assembly code for every single CPU architecture that we want to support. And not only that, the way you insert assembly in line into C code varies on a compiler to compiler basis. Fortunately though, most compilers have these built-in functions. So if you're using Visual Studio, MSVC, then you've got these byte swap U short, U long, U N64, and if you're using uh, GCC or I believe Clang has it as well, C Lang, then you've got these built-in underscore B swaps 16, 32, and 64. And using those built-in functions, those built-in functions should be mapped to the optimal instructions for each CPU. So without having to resort to assembly, you get the optimal uh, high performance in the swapping code. And this is where we get to our first gotcha. So if you look down here, everything is fine with Indian swapping or byte swapping integers. And then we get to a floating point number. This is 1.1. Uh, this is the value the way it is in the bits, bitwise uh, in hex format. And if we do a swap Indian 32, then, oh, that is nothing like what the byte swap version of this should be. So what's happened is you start with a floating point number and then you pass it to a function that takes an integer. So C and C++ will implicitly cast or convert that float to an integer. So in this case, 1.1 gets converted to one, and then it byte swaps that value. So in this case, we end up with a byte swap version of one, which is obviously not what we want. Instead, what we need is something called a bit cast. So that means you take the float and you convert it to an integer without doing any actual conversion. So you just take the bits and say, well, instead of, let's pretend that instead of this being a float, it's an integer. If you're using C20, so C year 2020 or newer, then they have a bit cast built in. However, that's not available on C and not available on older versions of C. So in that case, you need to pull a little trick with a union. So this union has a float and a 32-bit integer. You write to it as a float and you read it as an integer. And that will work on all compilers. And you can also do that with 64-bit floats or doubles. Same thing. There is another method that you can use uh, that uses pointer trickery, but let's not get into that. This works. If you use that, you look down here, We've used our swap Indian 32F and it is doing the byte swapping correctly because we don't have that implicit conversion from float to integer. 
Okay, the third method of doing NUS conversion is to use the conversion functions built into the networking stack. So a lot of people don't know this, but the TCP IP protocol that powers the internet is Big Endian. So things like the IP address is stored in Big Endian format, which means that it needs to be converted on little Endian CPUs. And to do that, the networking stack has provided some convenient little functions or macros like H2NS, which converts a 16-bit number, that means short, short integer. There's H2NL, and on Windows, you've also got H2NLL for 64-bit numbers. And likewise, you've got the inverse saying N to, so N is network byte order, to H, which is host CPU byte order. So you've got H2NS and N to HS, and, and, and so on and so forth. And these, so these are convenient functions that allow you to convert things like IP addresses to network byte order on any machine. Now there is one problem with these functions, and that is that they only convert endianers on little endian machines, because on big endian machines already store numbers in big endians, so they do not need IP addresses, for example, do not need to be converted to network byte order because it's already in the right order. This is not a mistake. They're doing exactly what they're intended to do. So the fourth and final method is to use C++ 2023's new byte swap function. Yes, as far as C++ is concerned, they have finally, finally got a standard method of doing byte swapping. Uh, you do need a very new compiler, though. My, the, the version of Visual Studio that I have installed is too old. Uh, you can see here in my make file, I'm saying we need the C++ 23, uh, 2023 standard. Uh, so it, yeah. I can do it with uh, the GCC that I've installed though. And if you've got that, if you've got a compiler that's new enough, then you can include the bit header and you can use the byte swap function. And you don't need to worry about whether it's 1632 or 64 bit, it'll just do whatever needs to be done. Uh, and if you're from C++ 2020, there's also a way to check what the ending, uh, a standard way finally to check what the endianess is. Sadly, this is not available for C. Now, all of the example code I've shown so far isn't best practice for writing multi-platform software. And that's because I wanted to do the byte swapping regardless of whether the CPU is little endian or, or big endian. But in the real world, uh, if you're writing multi-platform software that needs to work on multiple CPUs, you, you want big endian numbers to be converted to little endian on little machines. You don't want big endian numbers converted on big endian machines and vice versa. So on a big endian machine, if there are numbers that need to be in, converted to and from little endian, you want the conversion to happen and you don't want that to happen on little endian machines. So to do that, we can take the cue from the networking stack functions. So remember how the networking stack had H2NS and that and H2NL and whatnot, and they only did something on little endian CPUs because network byte order is big endian. Well, we can do the same thing. So it needs to be a bit of trickery to work around different compilers and systems doing different things. But then we create a whole bunch of, let me go down past the documentation area, we create a whole bunch of CPU to big endian 1632, 64, and big endian to CPU. And then down here, CPU to little endian and little endian to, C, uh, to CPU. So this, these functions say we are converting from C, CPU to big endian format. And you'll see here, this code down here is for a little endian CPU. So the little CPU to little endian macros here don't do anything. But the big endian ones do. And if, you, if we scroll up to our big endian uh, version of all of these macros, you'll see that the convert CPU to big endian or big endian to CPU, uh, all of those macros do nothing. And the ones that convert to and from little endian do. Now you might think, okay, this is a little bit redundant. You've got CPU to little endian 16 and then little endian to CPU 16, but they both do exactly the same thing. While that's true, having these, it's like self-documenting code. It tells you what the intent of the code is. So you know that right here, when you see CPU to little endian 16, 
you know this code is converting from the CPU's byte order to little endian. So the target is little endian. And when you see LE to CPU, you know that the source data is little endian and we're converting it back to the CPU. So it just, it makes it, at a glance, you can see what the code's purpose is. And that's why we do it that way. All of the code that you've seen in this video is downloadable from the Kia campus for creator and elite tier members. So you can join the campus to get this and a whole lot more. I'll leave a link below the video. That's it for now. I will see you in the next video, which should appear over here.